The Federal Aviation Administration's Aviation Safety Program presents the Safer Skies Aviation Training Series. The Safer Skies agenda originated in 1998 when the administrator and her team identified the most critical and most common causes for aviation accidents. Aeronautical decision making, weather, loss of control, controlled flight into terrain, survivability, and runway incursions. Together, these six make up the majority of all general aviation accidents. We encourage all airmen to view all six presentations. The FAA's primary goal is reducing fatal accidents, and that's a responsibility we all share. Let's take the time to focus our attention on these six critical subjects. Hello, my name is Ralph Hood and I'm the best looking pilot in the world. Actually, that's not true. I'm an aviation humorist. Half my lies aren't true. But today I'm here to talk seriously about aviation safety and the FAA's initiative called Safer Skies. Today we're going to talk about runway incursions and how to prevent them. I feel safe in saying that no pilot ever start off with the goal of using bad judgment and making errors in flying skills. But the accident reports are loaded with ugly statistics, of, frankly about pilots who made mistakes. I'm sure as pilots that you've never made an error or a mistake in judgment. Well, I'm here to tell you that I sure have. And the point is, I am here to tell you. This program is about helping us identify the issues and the solutions that will help us all become better aviators. The overall goal of the Safer Skies program is to reduce the number of fatal accidents in general aviation. That's a lofty goal when you consider that in a recent five-year period there were 9,087 general aviation accidents in an estimated 138 million flight hours. Now that's one accident for every 15,000 flight hours. 19% of these accidents were fatal, resulting in 2,976 deaths. So how do we fix that? Well, the first step in finding a solution to any problem is recognizing that there is a problem. And believe you me, we do have a problem when it comes to runway incursions. In fact, the worst accident in aviation history was a runway incursion in 1977 in the Canary Islands that killed 583 people on the ground. The common denominator in every runway incursion is human factors. This simply means that somebody made a mistake. And these mistakes come in three categories. Pilot deviation, obviously the pilot's error. Operational error, a controller mistake. And equally dangerous, a vehicle pedestrian deviation when someone, usually a non-pilot, drives a tug or tractor into the wrong place at the wrong time. This takes us back to the root of all aviation safety issues, aeronautical decision making or ADM. I think you'll quickly agree that basic ADM issues are at play throughout the entire process of planning and executing a flight. And make no mistake, taxiing, whether on land or water, is part of that flight. I don't really like to admit this, but my only aviation accident occurred while I was taxiing slowly on the ground. Taxiing is a very dangerous part of every flight because we treat it too casually. I know that's what I did. Now like me, this is an old cliche, but the flight is not over until the key is safely in your pocket. ADM is defined as a systematic approach to the mental process used by pilots to consistently determine the best course of action in response to a given set of circumstances. 
Another way to look at ADM is controlling the errors. Error management within the aeronautical decision-making process relies upon situational awareness, problem or threat recognition, and good judgment in resolving the threat or the error. A simple way to apply the decision-making process is the three P's. Perceive, process, perform. Take in all of the available information, figure out what to do with that information, and then do it. After the perform step, evaluate the outcome of your action, which starts the 3P process all over again. Perceive, process, perform. That's a good formula to remember. It applies to all the situations encountered in a flight from tie down to tie down. So let's get started on our runway safety program. Hi, I'm Kermit Weeks, creator and founder of Fantasy of Flight here in Central Florida. The Federal Aviation Administration has compiled some extensive and very accurate information regarding runway incursions and runway collisions. The latest report includes four years consecutive data through September 2003 and addresses towered airports only. In that four years, there were about 180,000 operations per day at as many as 490 towered airports in the United States. Of these 262 million aircraft operations, there were 1,475 runway incursions, about one per day. There are about a billion ways to present and interpret statistics, so we're going to keep it simple and just hit the summaries and highlights. One of the most outstanding facts is that GA represented 57% of the total aircraft operations in the period, but represented 75% of the runway incursions. The majority of these were pilot deviations. That's a lot of oops. I'd like to clarify some points that will help us understand the issues. Let's start with some definitions. The definition of runway incursion is any occurrence at an airport involving an aircraft, vehicle, person or object on the ground that creates a collision hazard or results in a loss of separation with an aircraft taking off, intending to take off, landing, or intending to land. Runway incursions are identified and tracked at towered airports. Runway incursions are further classified into three operational categories and four severity classifications. A pilot deviation is an action taken by a pilot that results in violation of Title 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations. An operational error is an action taken by an air traffic controller that causes a loss of separation as defined in FAA Order 7210.56a. Lastly, a vehicle pedestrian deviation is an entry or movement on the airport movement area by a pedestrian or by a vehicle, including an aircraft operated by a non-pilot, that has not been authorized by air traffic control. One more and I promise I'm finished. A surface incident is an event during which unauthorized or unapproved movement occurs within the movement area or an occurrence in the movement area associated with the operation of an aircraft that affects or could affect the safety of flight. Stick with me for just a minute more and we can move on. The classifications of severities are Category A, separation decreases and participants take extreme action to narrowly avoid a collision or the event results in a collision. Category B, separation decreases and there is a significant potential for a collision. Category C, separation decreases but there is ample time and distance to avoid a potential collision or Category D, little or no chance of collision, but meets the definition of a runaway incursion. Now that we've defined the kinds of incidents and their severity, you'll understand the good news that 87% of all runaway incursions in the United States in the period studied were Category C and D, and that only 64 incursions were Category A, and only four lives were lost. But the fact that there are so many incursions underscores the point that the potential for disaster is hanging over our heads like a level 5 thunderstorm. So what are we doing to assure runway safety? Let's look at the groups and the causes. Vehicle pedestrian deviations accounted for 20 percent. 
The most common errors were A, pedestrians or privately owned vehicles not authorized on the movement area or airfield that entered the runway without authorization by air traffic control, and B, personnel or airport vehicles authorized on the movement area or airfield and instructed to hold short of the runway and whose operators verbally acknowledged the instructions and entered the runway. Operational errors accounted for 23% of all runway incursions. The most common errors here are A, controllers momentarily forget about an aircraft vehicle, a previously issued clearance, or a runway closure. B, controllers and pilots or vehicle operators commit communication errors like readback errors. C, tower controllers fail to coordinate with each other in the handling of aircraft on the surface. And D, controllers misjudge aircraft separation. The big bugaboo is pilot deviations at 57%. And the primary reasons have been identified as A, pilots read back controllers' instructions correctly but did not comply with the instructions. B, pilots failed to hold short of the runway as instructed and crossed or taxied into position on the runway. And C, pilots accepted clearances issued to an aircraft other than their own. Ever been in any one of those situations described above? I know I have. Fortunately, like my friend Ralph Hood, I'm still here to talk about it. GA pilots have fewer issues at predominantly GA airports than at airports with a heavier mix of commercial or military aircraft. Typically, the bigger airports are more complex, so that makes sense. In fact, one of the worst airports in the country for runway incursions was, before tremendous improvements, Fort Lauderdale Executive. FXE in Florida. Though there's no commercial traffic, that airport is very busy with GA activity, ranging from flight schools to corporate jets, and has a pretty complex array of runways and taxiways. Busy and complex, hmm. Interestingly, the FAA and FXC have dramatically turned that story around and made significant progress in dealing with the issues of runway safety. We've gathered a group of pilots, controllers, and managers of varied experience who have all been part of the team addressing the problems and solutions at Fort Lauderdale Executive. Let's hear what they have to say. Today, we'll be discussing and sharing with you the positive behavioral changes that have occurred at Fort Lauderdale Executive Airport environment. The Runway Safety Action Team got together, came down here to try to figure out what we could do to prevent and decrease the number of incursions. So we uh, implemented a special emphasis program in May of 2002. What we found uh, when we visited uh, Fort Lauderdale Executive was that there was a culture there where it was a small airport that turned into a very large general avi aviation airport. And there were a lot of pilots and uh, tenants who took ownership of that airport and thought it was their airport. And so we found problems with uh, pilots who were able to drive to their hangars and taxi cab drivers who were able to come into the gates to drop passengers off. For instance, an airline captain that landed at the airport in his own private aircraft and thought that he was landing at a, at a different airport, uh, just, uh, just unaware of uh, his situational awareness with the small airplane. Um, another instance where a pilot had been cleared to taxi and hold short of a runway, but, uh, and he acknowledged that uh, instruction, but still taxied up and crossed the whole line and interfered with another aircraft departing on that same runway. So there was another interesting one that we had with the uh, Baldur CFI and involved a, uh, an airline captain also. The uh, airline captain came to get checked out in a you know, small plane, a single engine Cessna, and he's with the CFI and uh, they're taxiing out. And what they ultimately wind up doing is taking the active runway without a clearance. And the confusion existed primarily because of the thing that we talk about all the time, the human factor is, uh, is a big common denominator in all of the uh, investigations that we do. The decision-making process for the air traffic controller is a, a real complex and a fragile uh, activity, and um, they're juggling a number of different elements when they're trying to make that decision. And of course, here at Fort Lauderdale Exec, being Delta airspace, they don't have a radar 
they don't provide radar services per se. So they have to convey what they need from the pilot just for the verbal uh, observation, or visual observation and verbal communications. The amount of traffic at Fort Lauderdale exec is very varied. The general aviation the experience level of the pilots is, is very different and we work like everything else, we, we establish a rhythm and you you expect to say something, hear something, say something, hear something. You you just develop a feel that when an airplane touches down, you can turn your back and assume that okay, he should be clear now and turn around and he'll and he'll be clear, you can clear the next one. A lot of times we have many young controllers that come on board and they're checked out. Mm -hmm. And they've never really seen the environment from the other side, mm -hmm. from the pilot's perspective. Mm -hmm. So we try to get them out a little bit so that they can see, okay, this is what the pilot's environment is like, and this is what he's hearing and feeling, what he's trying to decipher as he navigates through this uh, through this airport. Mm -hmm. And what, after one of our meetings here, we had a meeting in the airport while we were waiting for our plane, and we designed these little memo pads because we said, you know, what the pilots need to do is write down their taxi instructions and the vehicle operators need to write down their taxi instructions because short-term memory will betray you and you'll forget what you were supposed to do. So we designed these little pads and then sure enough it caught on nationwide and now the headquarters is producing them for, uh, for us. One of the things that, that I think has, has had a, a great effect on reducing incursions is pilots taxiing with a sterile cockpit. They're not running checklists, copying clearances, et cetera, et cetera. But we as controllers need to know that they're going to taxi with the sterile cockpit, and I'm not going to give you that clearance while you're taxiing. Wait, then pilots, are get, they're just busy in the cockpit programming their uh, global positioning navigation systems or trying to reprogram new communication systems or dealing with just new regulations. The pilot's just, just busy. But you have to strike a balance between looking out the window when you're taxiing and getting your head out of the GPS and, and putting the numbers in, setting your radio frequencies and all of that. You've got to get your head up and look out the window. They, you know, they're sort of reluctant to hesitant to ask for progressive taxi progressive instructions. Taxi. They feel, I think some pilots have expressed the, the uh, notion that when they have to ask for progressive, that makes them a, a, a novice pilot and they're, and they're professionals. But uh, you'll, you'll ask the, the, the really professional pilots out there, the airline pilots and the others, they, they do not hesitate to ask for progressive instructions. It's the safest thing to do. Well, see, you go, if you go to the other side of the spectrum, one of the things that, that we've been putting out at the seminars is asking the student pilots to fess up. Right. Mm -hmm. If you tell us that you're a student pilot, you're about to get the best service that you're ever going to get for the rest of your flying career. Mm -hmm. We'll say things a little slower, listen a little harder, and we will give progressive uh, taxi instructions, but remember that's not a substitute for an airport diagram. Right. Right. Or or an and, right. and that's what yeah. was happening at, at Fort Lauderdale Executive after I would listen in on the transceiver and I welcomed them into the airport just to see what they were using a diagram. Initially, I would say 90% did not even have a diagram with them. It's at Atlanta Airport with Delta based there and pilots mm -hmm. flying in and out. When they taxi out, both pilots have their airport diagram out, mm -hmm. and, and many of the other carriers have, have followed suit with that. When you think about it, flight instructors really are the gatekeeper of aviation. I mean, all of us that operate aircraft have had instructors in the past. You have to deal with instructors to get to your certification point and so forth, and hopefully you have good instructors that teach you the right sorts of things. So uh, the instructor population is extremely critical to uh, not just the, the runway environment and runway uh, safe surface operations, but also all the things that we do in operating aircraft. Mm -hmm. Initially, I'll think back on my own training. I can't remember my instructor way back then doing much about how I got from one point on the airport to the other point. The most concern was get that plane up in the sky and get it down safely. After that, that's, that's the whole story. But I saw it equated to a little bit like flying in the, in the system out here, or driving a car, driving down the highway, you're sitting there on a nice open highway at 60 miles an hour uh, in a, an automobile and you sort of relax, but when you see you're coming up to an intersection, now it's a little bit congested, there may be traffic lights, there's other cars to come mm -hmm. in from the side, you, you should become a little more aware and, and sort of straighten up in that car seat and pay a little more attention to the light and, and what's going on at that busy position. 
I sort of look at the airport the same way. When you're when you're up at uh, ten thousand or at nine thousand in a little, in a small private aircraft, and you're sort of comfortable and it's nice and quiet, but when you come down to land at that airport or taxi in or even taxi out, that's when you you should be real cautious because that's when problems will happen. Said thirty eight percent of the risks in aviation take place before you ever take off. Right. And 23 percent of the incidents take place before you ever take off. So it's yeah. one of those things that I, I, I understand that Flight Standards is starting to, uh, is going to start placing more emphasis on ground taxi operations. We had to, yeah, that, that right that's day? right, Dan. And that occurs on both ends of the flight also, not just the, not just the departure, not just before you take off, but also when the flight's finished and you land, and there's, a, there's a natural human tendency to kind of relax, relax. at that point. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just driving now. Mm -hmm. But I tell you, I had a, uh, I had a very excellent flight instructor many years ago press upon me the importance of the thought that you don't really stop flying that airplane until it's parked, parked it's in place, place the engines are shut down, and the chocks are in place. Okay, then you can go ahead and consider the flight over. There's there's one primary principle that a pilot always ought to adhere to, and that is trust ATC and verify absolutely everything that they do. I mean, to scan the runway when you move out on the runway. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many, several times in my career did I clear an aircraft into position and hold, and he reminded me that there was somebody on short final, and so he stopped. Now I'd have to say that I probably prevented more runway incursions in my career, or I saw ATC prevent more runway incursions than they ever caused, but nonetheless, that the potential for a mistake is out there, and how does a pilot verify unless he is fully attentive to the environment that he's in? When you hear the controller just in the background speaking to other airplanes, be generally aware of what he's talking about. If he taxis you into position and hold for another departing aircraft, and you hear him clear another airplane to land, sometime in the next coming seconds, there should be something at the back of your neck saying, I should be rolling, I should be rolling. If you're not, call and ask. Ask the controller saying, hey, you know, I'm still here, and he'll either clear you for takeoff or tell you to get off the runway, one of the two. What do you expect from, or you would like to see from the pilots? Is there something that, I know as pilots, we have our own impressions of what we would like to see from control. What does a controller want to see? Uh, we're, we're looking for basic proficiency and professionalism. If, uh, if a pilot comes in, I clear him to land, I expect him to land the airplane, turn off at the first available intersection, hold short of the taxiway, and contact ground to get a taxi clearance. And as ground control, I'm going to issue him a taxi clearance, and I expect him to comply it, as simply as it can be. Um, we spend a lot of time training certifying at our airports, etc. cetera, uh, we expect the same out of the pilots. I, I expect a pilot to have an airport diagram out. I have an airport diagram right in front of me, and that's my airport that I'm looking down on. I expect him to have one also. The air traffic controller's basic principle is to make your process of moving across my airport and through the airspace just as routine and uneventful as, it possibly, as we possibly mm -hmm. can do it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, I'm, I'm at a loss to well, I think to, it was to, 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 make, to com convey right. what it is that I expect. I think from that was you. a good answer you gave, Dan, because I'm thinking of it from the uh, from the pilot's perspective, and all the things that you just mentioned are the things that I hope to expect from ATC when I'm accessing ATC services. For example, uh, I like to use the use of standard phraseology. Uh, yeah, there are certain circumstances that come up where something unusual is going on, and uh, you have to think quick and you have to use plain English to make a, 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 the receiver of that message understand what's happening. But by and large, standard phraseology is what helps us keep the system running smoothly. And, uh, and you know, in return, I give the controller standard phraseology too, so he doesn't have to guess about what I'm thinking or what I'm saying. I'll use standard phraseology. If there's any one thing that I would like to ex expect from a pilot is that he will never say Roger or Wilco if he misunderstand, he doesn't thoroughly understand what I right. just said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As long as he never says Roger or Wilco when he, there's a, um, an air of, of doubt in his mind, That's we'll be fine. Yeah, last year, Kansas City Center did a 30-day count on hereback 
read back errors and had seven over 790 in 30 days. That, that that's the ones that they caught that they could count. Yeah. Almost every air traffic control instruction is a suggestion because a pilot can refuse just about anything, anything that we say. That's correct. Yeah. But the neat thing about it is they understand that we're trying to make the system work, so they work as our partner. They take the initiative to make it all work uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. along with us. And so, I mean, it's a, it's a marvelous environment that we actually work in. And it only has just a few little flaws in it that we're trying to tweak here. And, and, and you know, and but making each other mindful of our little individual weaknesses. Right. That's about right. it. And when confusion does enter the picture of times, there's that nice little piece of standard phraseology that we do have. It says, say again. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Right. Well, you know, I think clarify. what it does. Uh, say two words, say again. And um, um, one thing, too, that um, we always, we like to stress to um, at meetings uh, when we visit airports, when in doubt, ask no matter how sure you think you are if you're if you in, if you're a, a locally based pilot or a transient or what have you if you're not sure of your location or where you're going you stop and you ask there's nothing wrong with asking Gabe, Gabe and Bob something <clears throat> that I know a lot of the pilots are concerned with and especially in the FAA is that they get the same group of people coming to all the safety meetings yes. right. and we're only getting about 30 percent of like the cool. flying community that yeah, comes to those ones. Mm -hmm. They're the, the ones that are consci yeah, they're yeah. conscientious ones. Yeah. So how do we reach that other 70% <laughs> or 80% whatever it is? We, we, we just keep trying like we are now. Continue with the safety meetings. Uh, continue and encourage those safety counselors that the safety program managers have working throughout the country. The FAA does not have the manpower to really go out and, and work mm -hmm. every situation. But right. through the safety program managers and their safety counselors, we're constantly putting on safety programs, and, and like you say, the, it's almost like preaching to the choir. When the, with the faithful few are always show up at the safety meetings, but we have to sort of encourage them to get back and, and get to their the ones that are not showing up. Encourage them to come out right. because this we all have a stake in this. This mm -hmm. is our lives out there on the line when we're out there in the aircraft operating on the airport in the system. So we want everybody to be safe with us. If, if we're going to be, you know, in order for us to be safe, we have to have all the pilots out there to be knowledgeable mm -hmm. and safe. Going back to a point that Ralph made earlier in the presentation, human factors is the common denominator in every runway incursion. In every situation, somebody made a mistake. In 57% of those situations, it was a pilot. The majority of those pilot deviations, as they are called, were pilots reading back controller's instructions correctly, but not complying with the instructions. Pilots failing to hold short of the runway as instructed and crossing or taxiing into position on the runway, or pilots accepting clearances issued to an aircraft other than their own. Knowing the signage and airport markings will go a long way in minimizing the confusion that might put us in the wrong place at the wrong time. Let's review them in the progressive order from ramp to runway. Taxi markings on aprons and ramp areas are yellow, white, or checkerboard black and white will mark vehicle roadways at some airports. Beyond the ramp area, you should only see yellow marking taxi routes as centerline or edge markings, or both. At night, taxiways are defined with blue lights on the edge of the taxiway, and sometimes with green centerline lights or reflectors. Signage. Taxiways are always alphabetical, runways always numerical. A yellow sign is a direction sign. A black sign is a location sign. Red signs with white inscription identify the entrance to a runway, prohibited areas, or hold short position. You always need clearance to pass these signs. They'll also be laid out logically relative to directions. 927, for example, means the threshold for runway 9 is to your left. Runway 27 is to your right. When you leave a non-movement area, like a ramp, and you head onto a taxiway or some other movement area, you should see a solid yellow line. Immediately adjacent to it is a dashed yellow line. That is a non-movement area boundary marking. Though it's permissible to cross from the dashed side to the solid side, ATC permission is always required to cross from the solid side to the dashed side at an airport with an operating control tower. Some airports, like FXE, are adding red and white lines and do not enter markings as further precautions. 
It's the same movement restriction if it's a double solid and double dashed line. The double solid line indicates a runway holding position marking. Do not let any part of the aircraft cross a solid line without permission from ATC. Solid stop, dashed, do. Some airports may have clearance bar lights or runway guard lights installed, either in the pavement or located on the side of the taxiway. These will be flashing yellow lights placed concurrent with the solid yellow hold short lines and mean the same thing. Do not cross without permission from ATC if there is an operational control tower. Some airports are using red lights instead of yellow as an experiment. It seems to be working very well. You might see also a bar of solid red lights in the runway designating a runway hold position. Just like in your car, red means stop. What if the tower is not operating? It's an uncontrolled field, and the tower frequency becomes the common tower advisory frequency, CTAF. Treat your communications just like Unicom at any other uncontrolled field. Land and hold short, LASO. Intersecting runways could be operational at the same time, or the active runway could intersect a crossing taxiway that's active. You may be issued a land and hold short instruction. LASO. Available landing distance ALD data are published in the Special Notices section of the Airport Facility Directory and the U.S. Terminal Procedures Publications.
worse in the suit during hurricane season. Uh, three Mike Charlie, hold short runway. Oh, uh, three Mike Charlie. Yeah, uh, sorry, sorry, I got distracted here. Uh, do you think that? Uh, yeah, we get that. I tell you what, wait a second. Let me let me get through all of this uh, ground stuff here before we talk about that again. Two very important steps to remember if you're at all unsure. First, stop. Think about what's going on, where you are. Second, regroup. If you're still not 100% sure, ask for a progressive taxi. I know this is a lot tougher for the men than for the women, but asking directions is not such a bad thing. Stop, ask, both good preventative medicines for runway incursionitis. Read back all hold short, position and hold, and runway crossing instructions. And don't just read them back. Know that when you read them back, you're saying to the controller that you heard and you understand the instructions and that you will comply. Remember that at the top of the list for general aviation runway incursions are pilots reading back these kinds of instructions and proceeding anyway, crossing hold lines and entering active runways and taxiways without a clearance. Another good SOP is to turn on beacon and nav lights when taxiing. Strobes work well in the daytime, but might be a distraction at night. Use your best judgment based on other aircraft in the vicinity. Turn on everything except landing lights when crossing a runway. This does two things. It makes you think about the fact that you're crossing a runway, and it lets controllers and other pilots know that you're about to cross. When you're cleared for takeoff and either in or rolling into position, turn on your landing lights. Again, it's a physical acknowledgement for you, but it's also a sign for everyone else that you're on the takeoff roll. At night, a good trick is to line up a few feet left or right of the center line for the beginning of your takeoff roll. That way, if you're delayed for some reason, other aircraft either landing or rolling into position will have a better chance of seeing you in the lights. Just like with defensive driving, always be on the lookout for other aircraft that might not be exactly where they're supposed to be. If you're truly listening to the tower before and during your takeoff clearance, you'll know where that Learjet is on final. And just like a green light when you're driving your car doesn't guarantee you that some guy is not about to run a red light and broadside you, a position and hold or cleared for takeoff does not guarantee that the controller didn't momentarily lose track of all his responsibilities. Cleared onto the active? Take a look around. Left, right, overhead, anybody on short final? Anybody down the active in a position for an intersection takeoff? There are some great new surface surveillance systems technology out there for both the cockpit and the tower cab that have already proven their worth. But for most of us, your best defense is right here. Be prepared by knowing the airport layout and checking instructions against a diagram. Know the signs and the markings. Avoid distractions. Heads up, eyes open, ears clear. Ask, know, verify. Read back all hold short, position and hold, and runway crossing instructions. Use your aircraft lights to announce your intentions. Remember, flying is like life. It's not about the destination. It's all about the journey. I'm Kermit Weeks with Fantasy of Flight. Let's all start and finish those journeys by all working towards the goal of greater runway safety. You know, when we take the time to analyze all of the factors involved in safely completing even a simple flight for a short distance, we begin to realize that the responsibilities we carry as pilots in command are not to be taken for granted. The goal should be zero mistakes, no errors. Realistically, that's not possible. But when the technical skills under your control are in hand and you've minimized the errors, the potential threats are greatly diminished. However, at every stage of flight, including the time you spend taxiing, there are continuing situations that require your recognition that's perceive your decisions, process, and your actions perform. Those three P's, perceive, process, and perform, should be constant and automatic whenever you're operating in any flight crew capacity in the air or on the ground. 
Recognizing that ground operations are just as much a part of the flight as keeping the shiny side up in IMC is just one more step in our continuing quest for safer skies.